Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be looking at some common special tests used in the diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome. But before we go any further, let's actually look at some of the important relevant anatomy here as it pertains to the carpal tunnel. So right here where I'm circling with my mouse, this is the carpal tunnel. And there's several structures here that we're going to talk about in a minute that actually run between the hand and the forearm. And they have to traverse through this tunnel. So the carpal tunnel is an anatomical passageway in the palmar side of the wrist that allows structures to pass between the hand and the forearm not shown here, and vice versa. What about the boundaries of the carpal tunnel? So there are three types of boundaries. One, we have the palmar boundary, and that's going to be this ligament right here that runs over the top. This is the transverse carpal ligament. You'll notice on one end it connects to the pisiform bone. On the other end it connects to this projection of the trapezium called the tubercle of the trapezium. Then we have the radial boundaries, which are the scaphoid and the tubercle of the trapezium. This cut of the carpal tunnel is a little bit too distal to see the scaphoid because that's one of the proximal carpals, but we can see that tubercle of the trapezium right here. The ulnar boundaries are the pisiform and the hook of hamate. Again, we can see the pisiform here. Here's the hamate. We can't really see the hook of it because that's a little bit more proximal to where this cut was taken, but those are the two things that occupy the ulnar boundary. Now the way to think about the carpal tunnel itself is the carpal bones right here sort of form a bowl, kind of like you have in the kitchen, and then there's certain things that sit inside the bowl, the contents, right? And then this transverse carpal ligament runs over the top and sort of forms a top or a cap to the bowl. And so basically the transverse carpal ligament sort of turns what was once a groove into an actual canal or a tunnel as it's called here. Let's now look at the things contained within that carpal tunnel. Numbers one and two are tendons of these two muscles, flexor digitorum profundus and flexor digitorum superficialis. So the deeper ones are for profundus, the more superficial ones are for superficialis, and there's four of each, so eight total right there. Then we have the median nerve, which is incredibly important for our discussion here on carpal tunnel syndrome. That's right here in yellow. Then we have the tendon of flexor pollicis longus, which is right here. And sometimes they'll include the flexor carpi radialis tendon, which is right here. You'll notice it's not actually within the carpal tunnel proper. It's actually within this small tunnel embedded within the transverse carpal ligament. So it's not within the carpal tunnel proper, but sometimes it will be included. So carpal tunnel syndrome is a condition resulting from compression of the median nerve as it traverses through the carpal tunnel. So this yellow structure here is the median nerve. It's going here from the forearm across the wrist through that carpal tunnel and then it makes its way into the hand where it divides to do various things. And as it goes through that carpal tunnel, it of course goes underneath this transverse carpal ligament. Now if something were to happen to cause this transverse carpal ligament to either become inflamed or maybe it shortens or maybe it becomes a little bit thicker, then there's going to be less space within that carpal tunnel and therefore less space for that median nerve. And so it can cause compression of that median nerve and that's going to result in paresthesias like numbness, tingling, and even burning shooting pain in some cases, although most commonly it's going to be numbness and eventually if it progresses it can result in weakness of some of the muscles in the hand that are innervated by the median nerve. So what is our mechanism of injury here? We're going to group these mechanisms into two kinds. One is going to be the chronic one. This is kind of your common one that you see in the clinic, overuse, repetitive type of movements. And then other ones which are very diverse and sometimes a little bit unintuitive. So for the chronic kind, we're looking at overuse injuries from anyone who constantly is performing wrist movements. Those could be high force movements. They could be low force long term movements like typing on a computer could be extreme wrist motions over and over again, or even people subject to prolonged vibration. All these things can cause this shortening, inflammation, and thickening of the transverse carpal ligament. Other causes can be a fracture or dislocation. Fracture and dislocation can cause compression within the carpal tunnel. 
Hand or wrist deformity could obviously do that as well. But then there's other things like pregnancy, alcoholism, diabetes, and many other things. Even uh, thyroid conditions can actually cause uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. Early on in carpal tunnel syndrome, even before the person might know that they have it, there's going to be numbness at night, tingling and or pain in the fingers. And normally it's going to be in this distribution right here. So in this kind of light purple, this is the sensory distribution of the median nerve in the hand. This is where you'd commonly see those paresthesias. And then you might see difficulty using the hand for small tasks like handling small objects, writing, typing. And the reason for that is if you're compressing this nerve, remember that there's also some motor branches that go out to, in particular, the thenar eminence muscles right here. And so if you're compressing the nerve that's leading out to those, well, then they're not going to be able to function as well. But at this stage, we're not going to see atrophy of the thenar eminence. A little bit later into the progression, sort of in an intermediate stage, you'll start to see a little more profound weakness in the hand, inability to perform fine motor tasks like buttoning a shirt and dropping objects more than usual. And then much later in the disease progression, you start to see atrophy of the thenar eminence. So these muscles right here are not only weak, but they're actually atrophying and becoming smaller on the thumb side. But note that the hypothenar eminence over here is going to be spared because the median nerve has nothing to do with these. These would actually be innervated by a branch of the ulnar nerve. Now the gold standard for diagnosing carpal tunnel syndrome is a nerve conduction study. The basic idea with that is there's a normal range for the velocity of nerve conduction at different points along the upper extremity. And so there's a normal range of velocities across the carpal tunnel. So what they'll do is they'll measure the velocity of conduction across that carpal tunnel. And if it's lower by a certain amount, they can then say that it's due to compression of that median nerve and diagnose the person with carpal tunnel syndrome. So unless you're trained in nerve conduction studies, we have to rely on several special tests, most of which are provocative tests, and that's what we're going to cover right now. Now these first two special tests are very similar. They're Phelan's test and reverse Phelan's test. Now Phelan's test is also called the reverse prayer test, and the reverse Phelan's test is also called the prayer test. To really understand why these are called as such, we're actually going to start by looking at the reverse Phelan's test, which is the prayer test. To conduct reverse Phelan's test, the patient's either going to be sitting or standing, and they're going to press the palmar aspects of both hands together, with both wrists coming to at least 90 degrees, as you see there, and hold for 60 seconds. A positive test is going to be reproduction of paresthesias at any point in that median nerve distribution. And by paresthesias, we mean numbness, tingling, or burning, shooting pain, although generally it's going to be numbness or tingling. Now with the reverse Phelan's test, the sensitivity and specificity have not been determined. So for that reason, it's probably best to go with Phelan's test. So Phelan's test is called the reverse prayer test because basically it's upside down compared to the prayer test. So patient is still going to be sitting or standing, but this time they're going to press the dorsal aspects of both hands together, both wrists at 90 degrees, and hold for 60 seconds. So it's basically an upside down or a reverse prayer position. And again, hold for 60 seconds, and a positive test is going to be reproduction of those paresthesias at any point in the median nerve distribution. Now the sensitivity of this test varies, but in the study that I looked at, the sensitivity was given as 84% and the specificity is 87%, so that's pretty good. Now we're going to look at Tennell's test. Anytime you hear the word Tennell, you need to think of percussing a nerve. So in Tennell's test, the patient's going to be seated with their arm face up on a table like this, and the PT is going to percuss along the wrist crease over the median nerve distribution, like you see here. Sometimes they'll start a little bit proximal to the wrist, but making sure to go at least up to that wrist crease. A positive test is going to be paresthesias in the median nerve distribution. And again here, the sensitivity is 82%, specificity is 89%. So that is Tennell's test. Next is the hand elevation test. For this, the patient's either going to be sitting or standing, doesn't matter, and the patient's going to lift their hands above their head and hold for two minutes, so you probably want to get out a stopwatch for this one. And a positive test is going to be paresthesias that are reproduced in the median nerve distribution. 
The sensitivity here is 87% and specificity is 89%. Now the flick sign is not so much a special test, it's more something the patient reports that relieves their paresthesias, although if they come in and already have paresthesias, you can try this if they haven't already to see if it relieves their symptoms. So basically the patient sometimes is able to relieve their paresthesias by flicking their wrists like this. Believe it or not, that sometimes can relieve the paresthesias. And you could think of it as a positive test if the paresthesias are relieved or reduced by this maneuver. Last, we're going to look at the square wrist sign. So I have two images of my wrist right here. One is a side view that goes from anterior to posterior, and the other is a top-down view from medial to lateral. And so to do this test, the patient's going to be in sitting with their arm resting on a table or something like that, and you're going to take the following two wrist measurements. One, you're going to take the AP dimension, so you're going to turn the wrist on its side, and go from anterior to posterior at the wrist crease and get a measurement. And then you're going to do the same thing from medial to lateral and get a measurement. Now obviously the medial lateral dimension is going to be larger than the anteroposterior dimension. But in carpal tunnel syndrome there may be swelling on the palmar side of the wrist where the carpal tunnel is. And so that's going to increase the length of this AP dimension. And so to determine the result of the test, you take the ratio of the AP dimension and the ML dimension, so AP divided by ML. And it's a positive test when this ratio is greater than 0.7. For a normal healthy carpal tunnel, this ratio will be less than 0.7. So hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of how to diagnose carpal tunnel syndrome. And in the next video, we'll go over some exercises and treatments for carpal tunnel syndrome. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.